Greetings, my name is Stephen Myers and I am the founder of the Pharaoh's Pump Foundation. This is the introductory video of a series of videos about our research concerning how the Great Pyramid was built. All we ask is that you watch the entire series of videos and ponder the information they contain. An important aspect of our research is that water was pivotal to the construction and purpose of the Great Pyramid. There is much evidence for water on the Giza Plateau. Uh, Herodotus described the Great Pyramid as being surrounded by water like an island. He even mentioned that the Great Pyramid had an artificial duct connected to it. Sir Flanders Petrie found Nile earth inside the passages of the Great Pyramid which is understood to be sediment. The casing stones of the Great Pyramid are cemented together and the joints between them are watertight. The Great Sphinx and its enclosure are famous for being eroded by water. Our contention is that water was pivotal to the Great Pyramid and the role water played in the construction and purpose of the Great Pyramid will be described in greater detail in subsequent videos. Water was pivotal to the construction and purpose of the Great Pyramid. The Nile River was used to move many of the stones of the Great Pyramid on barges. One of the research organizations I am associated with has done a great deal of research and discoveries about water and erosion in and around ancient Egypt as well as on the Giza Plateau. That organization is called Giza for Humanity and I invite you to visit their website at www.gizaforhumanity.org. Another important issue concerning the Great Pyramid is the order in which the stones were set in place. It is our contention that the Great Pyramid was built level by level from the bottom up. In very basic terms, the first level of the Great Pyramid was built including casing stones. After the first level, or course, was completed, the next higher level of the Great Pyramid was built, including casing stones. So basically, the Great Pyramid was built level by level, or course by course, including all the interior stones and the uh, casing stones for each level until the capstone was set in place. The Great Pyramid was built level by level, including casing stones, from the bottom up. The animations in this video series are intended to be very simple. The intent of these animations are not to concentrate on issues such as scale or complexity. Their purpose is much more important. The animations are intended to convey the major aspects of the fascinating construction procedures used to build the Great Pyramid. But more importantly, the casing stones for each level or course were set in place first for that level and then the interior stones were set in place for that level. So the bottom level of casing stones were set in place first and then the rough cut interior stones of the first level were set in place. When all of those stones were set in place, the first level of the Great Pyramid was completed. Flanders Petrie was of the opinion that the Great Pyramid was built level by level and that the casing stones for each level were set in place first before the interior stones of that level were set in place. So the order of stone placement described in these videos is consistent with the order of stone placement Flanders Petrie wrote about. The paving stones which support the first level of casing stones were set in place. Then the first level or course of casing stones were set in place. Then the interior stones were set in place for that level. The second course of casing stones were set in place. After that the second course of interior stones were set in place. In, in basic terms that is the order of placement of stones of the Great Pyramid. This will be elaborated on in detail in subsequent videos of this series. This series of videos will include computer generated animations which depict a number of important issues about the construction of the Great Pyramid.
This video series will describe how stones were set in place in a very rapid manner, how the large casing stones were moved to the building site and set in place, how the largest stones were moved from the Nile River up to the building site is described, as well as how the largest stones were moved to the necessary height and set in their final resting place. Also, how the capstone was ultimately set in place, if there was one, is described, as well as so much more. So please watch and enjoy this video series about how the Great Pyramid was built. Talk about our research on Facebook and Twitter. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us through our website at www.thepump.org. Thank you. In the introductory video, it was asserted that water played a key part in the construction of the Great Pyramid. Also, we contend that the Great Pyramid was built level by level. First, the paving stones that supported the first level of casing stones were set in place. Then the first level of casing stones were set in place. There was also a wall built around the Great Pyramid construction site. The following animation will help visualize the first stages of construction. First, the paving stones and the wall around the Great Pyramid were built. Then the first level of casing stones were set in place. The casing stones were cemented together watertight. Then a water lock was built directly into the first level of casing stones. The original builders provided a water source to the building site. The source of this water is described later in subsequent videos. The wall around the Great Pyramid was built as an enclosure wall to impound a pond. The first level of casing stones precision cut and cemented together watertight also impounded a pond. These two ponds were at different levels. The pond impounded by the casing stones was of a higher level than the pond impounded by the wall around the Great Pyramid. The water lock built into the wall of casing stones allowed stones on barges to travel between the lower pond and up into the higher pond. Water entered the area impounded by the enclosure wall built around the Great Pyramid construction site. Water filled the area impounded by the first level of casing stones. The casing stone pond is higher than the enclosure wall pond. These two ponds are connected by a water lock. The stone on a barge can move from the pond impounded by the enclosure wall up into the pond impounded by the casing stones through the water lock. With the introduction of water, the movement of stones on barges becomes extremely easy. The use of water locks to move cargo is fast, powerful, and consistent with the direct physical evidence on the Giza Plateau. This is why the casing stones were cemented together watertight, which allowed this efficient system to move the stones up into the pond impounded by the first level of casing stones. The use of water, barges, and water locks is versatile and adaptable to all of the stone moving requirements necessary to construct the Great Pyramid. The techniques used to move this and set in place the stones of the Great Pyramid will be described in subsequent videos, but for now, let's watch the stone on barge move from the lower pond up into the pond impounded by the casing stones. A stone on barge enters the water lock. The stone on barge rises up to the level of the pond impounded by the casing stones. The stone on barge leaves the water lock and enters the pond impounded by the casing stones. That is how stones on barges were able to be moved from the pond impounded by the enclosure wall up into the pond impounded by the first level of casing stones.
But how was that heavy casing stone, weighing up to 16 tons, moved from the barge to its final resting place? How did the barge with casing stone get to the building site from the Nile River? How was the rough cut interior stones for the first level set in place with the pond in the way? How are the most massive stones weighing up to 70 tons moved to the building site and set in their final destination? These questions and more are addressed in subsequent videos of this video series about how the Great Pyramid in the previous video, we saw how a stone on barge was moved from the pond impounded by the enclosure wall up into the pond impounded by the first level of casing stones. But how did a barge carrying a heavy stone get to the building site? The original builders had provided a water source at the building site which supplied water to a series of water locks between the building site and the Nile River. This series of water locks allowed stones on barges to travel from the Nile River all the way up to the building site and ultimately into the pond impounded by the casing stones. A water lock system was built between the Nile River and the building site. This allowed stones on barges to be easily delivered to the building site. Stones on barges were easily moved from the Nile River all the way up to the building site. This series of water locks from the Nile River to the construction site was the means in which stones on barges were transported. All Egyptologists agree that casing stones were moved using barges even though there is no physical evidence of the barges that were used to move the casing stones of the Great Pyramid. This is because the quarries for the casing stones are across the river from the building site. The use of water locks provided a systematic, fast, and powerful method to move heavy payloads. The use of water locks provided production line efficiencies to move the massive amount of material needed to build the Great Pyramid. The animations in this video series are intended to be very simple. The intent of these animations are not to concentrate on issues such as scale or complexity. Their purpose is much more important. The animations are intended to convey the major aspects of the fascinating construction procedures used to build the Great Pyramid. This relentless and systematic movement of stones allowed the materials to be brought all the way up to the pond impounded by the casing stones. Contrary to what many people think, water locks are an extremely fast method to move heavy payloads. In the 21st century, water locks are the system of choice to move our heaviest objects. The Panama Canal is currently being updated and modernized to move the largest objects that our civilization moves. 21st century engineers have chosen to use water locks to accomplish this task. The Three Gorges Dam in China will use water locks to allow ships to move cargo. In the 19th century, the Erie Canal in the United States was able to move cargo in excess of the weight of the Great Pyramid in just two years. The difference in elevation of one end of the Erie Canal compared to the other end is greater than the height of the Great Pyramid. The entire science of Egyptology has yet to move even one time a payload the weight of 16 tons. Water locks are ultra fast compared to Egyptologists. A simple canal using water locks is an elegant and sophisticated method to move stones. The use of water and water locks allowed the stones on barges to be moved with ease.
the original builders were truly geniuses. Water locks are efficient, powerful, and adaptable. They can be used to lift battleships as in the Panama Canal or be much smaller depending on the size of the payloads being transported. Water locks are used to move vessels over obstacles. In effect, water locks allow vessels to travel uphill. Stones on barges were easily brought to the building site. Yet many questions remain. What about the empty barges? How did they return back to the Nile? How are the large casing stones set in their final resting place? If they are too large to move by brute force, they must also be too large to set in their final resting place using back muscles. How are stones moved up higher and higher as the construction process continues? How are the heaviest stones moved and set in place? All these questions and more are described in subsequent videos in this video series about how the Great Pyramid was built. The construction process continued in a systematic manner. As each level was built, an additional water lock was built. A series of water locks allowed stones on barges to move up to the pond impounded by the casing stones. Each time the upper water lock was filled, another stone on barge entered the pond on top of the construction site. With the Great Pyramid being built level by level, the pond impounded by the casing stones is always about waist deep. Stone after stone floated on barges, uh, which moved up from the Nile River, up the series of water locks to the building site. Then they went up the series of water locks built into the casing stones, and then into the pond impounded by the casing stones. The Great Pyramid was built level by level, yet the pond on top of the Great Pyramid always remained about waist deep. The water locks are built into the wall of casing stones. Each water lock is built on top of and supported by the wall of casing stones below it. These water locks are an integral part of the wall of casing stones. Water is extremely heavy and the water locks need a substantial base to support them. They are like a rectangular box container sitting on top of the wall of casing stones below each water lock. Again, the pond impounded by the casing stones is only about waist deep and workers can stand on the level of rough cut interior stones as they wade in the pond moving barges and doing other tasks. After a level is completed, water is added to the pond which raises the surface of the pond up to the next level. Certainly, water has filled the gaps between these rough cut interior stones. These gaps are filled in all the way down to the bedrock with water. Water from the pond will not leak out of the pond through the cracks in the rough cut stones. This is because these cracks are already filled with water all the way down to the bedrock. The following animation shows that the pond is only waist deep because the Great Pyramid was built level by level. It also shows that water has already filled the gaps between the stones all the way down to the base of the Great Pyramid. When the next level is ready to be built, water is added to the pond which raises the surface of the pond to the next level. Workers were able to stand on the interior stones as they waited in the pond. Water existed between the cracks all the way down to bedrock. Yet, in the construction process, the pond always remained about waist deep. The pond is only waist deep, yet there is water between the rough cut interior stones all the way down to bedrock. The movement of stones is relentless and travel to the pond impounded by the casing stones in a production line efficiency. No ramp of any configuration is feasible. That is why the movement of full-size stones is never demonstrated by Egyptology.
the systematic use of water locks provided a production line efficiency in the movement of materials to the pond. Every time the upper pond was filled, another stone on barge entered the pond. The water locks are built into the wall of casing stones. Each water lock rests on top of the casing stones of the level below it. The ideas and concepts touched upon in these videos are fleshed out in the two books I have written about the Great Pyramid. The first book is titled Lost Technologies of the Great Pyramid and it is about how the Great Pyramid was built. My second book is called the Great Pyramid Prosperity Machine and it is about why the Great Pyramid was built. You can get these books from any bookstore. If they do not have them, you can, uh, they, the bookstore can order them for you. They are also available from Amazon.com and both of my books are available as Kindle eBooks that you can read on your Kindle or on your smartphone or on your PC or Mac. So if you're interested, you can get these books uh, any number of ways and they're available uh, for much more information than these videos can provide. This time-lapse film shows a water lock in the Panama Canal. Water locks are powerful and operate 24 hours a day seven days a week. Water locks are the system of choice to quickly move and to lift our most heaviest objects. The systematic construction process of moving stones continued as the Great Pyramid was built. If the stones cannot be moved using back muscles, they cannot be set in place using back muscles either. How were the stones taken off of barges in a fast manner? How were casing stones set in place very quickly without being damaged? How was the bonding agent placed between the casing stones so that the joints are watertight? What was done with the empty barges? Continue watching this video series to find out how the Great Pyramid was built. The vast majority of stones used to build the Great Pyramid weighed about two and a half tons. These rough cut stones were exposed when the casing stones were removed. These stones on barges moved up the water locks and into the pond impounded by the casing stones. These rough cut stones must be quickly moved from the barge and set into the pond. This was accomplished by using the sun barge as a floating crane. The so-called sun barges which were found in the boat pits at the base of the Great Pyramid were used to move the two and a half ton stones. The following animation illustrates the concept of how the sun barges were used. I have a pleasure boat and when the anchor gets stuck a simple but powerful technique is used to pull the anchor free. When the anchor is stuck, we walk to the bow of the boat. The anchor line is pulled tight and attached to the boat. Then we walk to the rear of the boat. This causes the boat to act like a lever. This exerts tremendous pulling force on the anchor line and pulls the anchor free. The sun barges were used in a similar manner. These so-called sun barges were used as floating cranes. They acted like a floating lever and the water was a fulcrum. Workers on the floating cranes would walk to the front of the crane, tipping the bow down. The two and a half ton rough cut interior stone was attached to a rope connected to the bow of the crane. 
The workers would then walk to the back of the crane. This would cause the crane to act like a lever and the bow would move up, lifting the stone off the barge. Once the stone is lifted by the floating crane, the crane is easily moved by workers wading in the waist-deep pond. When the floating crane is moved to the proper location, workers on the crane walk towards the front of the barge, which causes the bow of the crane to lower, which sets the stone down into the pond. How the stone is attached to the rope was difficult to animate, so that process was not depicted in the animation. That process is fully described in my book, Lost Technologies of the Great Pyramid. The rough cut interior stone is attached to the rope. Workers walk to the back of the floating crane. This causes the crane to act like a lever and the water to act like a fulcrum. The crane pivots and lifts the stone from the barge. The empty barge is moved out of the way. The boat crane is moved into position. The workers walk toward the front of the barge. The stone is lowered into the pond and set down at its final resting place. It was a fast and easy process to move the two and a half ton stones from their barges to their final resting place. This was how the vast majority of the stones used to build the Great Pyramid were moved to their final resting place. Research indicates that the barges used could support a single 16 ton casing stone. That would mean a single barge could conceivably carry five rough cut interior stones. This would allow the construction process to progress at a tremendous rate. Although there are many boat pits on the Giza Plateau, there are two floating cranes which have survived from antiquity. Although the scale of the barge, which holds the rough cut interior stones, compared to the stones is not perfect, the following animation illustrates how two stones were taken from a single barge at the same time. Again, how the ropes were attached to the stones is not depicted, but it is explained in my book. Workers walking on the floating barge cranes cause them to act like powerful levers and two stones are lifted from a single barge at the same time. The assembly process progresses at a rapid rate, a rate more rapid than any Egyptologist could ever match. There are many questions which remain which will be answered in subsequent videos in this series. But the immediate question is, what is done with all those empty barges? I think that you will be surprised by the answer, which is the subject of the next video. In the previous video, we saw how two and a half ton stones were moved from a barge to their final location. Now in this video, we will see how large 16 ton casing stones were moved from a barge and placed at their final location. Moving large casing stones in a rapid manner without handling scars by hand or with back muscles is impossible. The process described in this video is fast, powerful, and controllable. The process was accomplished using specialized barges and stone moving techniques that are readily apparent with the use of water locks and barges. The following animation shows one type of specialized barge which allowed the fast and easy method to move casing stones off of a barge. The barge is shown in cross-section. Water is allowed to enter the barge, which allows the barge and stone to move down. Water is removed from the barge, which moves the barge and stone up. As in most waterlock systems, the barges were narrow. The barges were built to be narrower than the width of the casing stone. This would allow the casing stone to overhang the barge a little bit on each side. The casing stone on barge would be moved between two supports. Water would be allowed to enter the barge, which would lower the barge and the stone. The stone would come to rest on the two supports. The barge with water in it could be moved out of the way.
water is allowed to enter the barge, which allows the stone to come to rest on the supports. The barge is still able to float and can be moved out of the way. The barge with water in it is still able to float, but it is low in the water. The bottom of the barge is not resting on the bottom of the pond impounded by the casing stones. This barge is moved to the edge of the pond. Workers can quickly siphon water from the barge over the side of the pond which will allow the barge to become fully buoyant again. The workers use a hose filled with water that has a valve on both ends. One end of the hose would go into the barge while the other end was over the side of the pond. Opening both valves allowed water to be siphoned from the barge. A worker operates a valve on the siphon hose, which allows water to be siphoned from the barge. The casing stone has quickly been removed from the barge, and the barge has been quickly uh, emptied of water. Another specialized barge had two compartments. One compartment was forward and the other one aft. Allowing water to enter either of these compartments would allow the barge to pivot. Also, allowing water to enter both compartments would cause the barge and stone to move vertically. By using this type of specialized barge, casing stones were moved to their final location. The barge with two compartments is shown in cross-section. This specialized barge can both pivot and move vertically. The following animation shows an application using a barge with two compartments. The barge supports a casing stone on one end, while water in the rear compartment acts like a counterbalance. Using a hand-operated valve for each compartment, the amount of water entering each compartment was easily controlled. Water was easily removed by siphoning water over the edge of the pond impounded by the casing stones. The importance of the following animation is not the exact scale, but to illustrate the concept of using a specialized barge in this manner. The barge with two compartments is shown in cross-section. By varying the amounts of water in each compartment, the casing stone can be lifted, lowered, or pivoted. This specialized barge already has water in both compartments. This causes the barge to ride low in the water. The barge is moved to the casing stone which is resting on the supports. Water is siphoned from the barge which causes the barge to rise up in the water. The barge rises up and supports the back edge of the casing stone. The barge riding low in the water because it has water in both compartments is moved to the back of the casing stone. Water is siphoned out of the barge, which causes the barge to rise up and support the back of the casing stone. Now the casing stone is ready to be attached to the barge. Shims are placed on the corners of the casing stones. 
Ropes are used to attach the casing stone to the barge. The shims keep the ropes from being damaged by the sharp corners of the casing stones. Water is removed from the barge by siphoning the water over the edge of the pond impounded by the casing stones. This causes the barge to lift the casing stone up off the supports it was resting on. Shims and ropes are used to attach the casing stone to the barge. Water is siphoned from the barge. The barge lifts the stone off of the supports. This specialized barge with water in the back compartment acting like a counterbalance can now move the casing stone over towards the edge of the pond. This 16 ton casing stone is located just above its final resting place, yet there is much more to the process of setting a stone to where it will stay for centuries. The following video in this series will depict the remainder of the process the original builders used to set in place casing stones when they built the Great Pyramid. In a previous video we saw how the casing stone was moved from a barge and is now positioned just above its final resting place. In this video we will see the rest of the process of setting in place a casing stone of the Great Pyramid. An extremely strong bonding agent is applied to the adjoining casing stones which provided a watertight seal. Then water is allowed to enter the barge which lowers the barge and casing stone down onto the bonding agent. The ropes and shims are removed from the casing stone. Additional water is allowed to enter the barge which lowers the barge completely from the casing stone. Then the barge is moved out of the way and water is siphoned out of the barge. The casing stone settles down on the bonding agent. The following animation depicts these processes. The casing stone is positioned just above its final resting place. The extremely strong bonding agent is applied. Water enters the barge which causes the casing stone to lower down onto the bonding agent. The ropes and shims are removed. Additional water enters the barge and it lowers away from the casing stone. The barge is moved out of the way and water is quickly siphoned out of the barge. The casing stone is resting on the bonding agent. The casing stone is almost in its final resting place. It still must be quickly moved against the casing stone it is beside and also needs to be moved so that it is in alignment with the rest of the casing stones. The casing stone is not quite at its final resting place. It must be moved in two directions. At this point in the process, a very specialized barge was used to position the casing stone to its final resting place. Unlike other barges, this barge is allowed to be flooded, so the bottom of the barge rests on the bottom of the pond. 
The purpose of this barge is to provide a sturdy fulcrum for two levers. These two levers move the casing stone in the two directions necessary to position a casing stone. This barge has two auxiliary barges which are attached to the main barge with hinges. When the auxiliary barges are allowed to fill with water, they pivot. This pivoting action with linkages exerts a tremendous force on the casing stone, positioning the casing stone to its final exact location. A specialized barge built to position the casing stone is moved in place. The following animation shows details of this unusual and specialized barge. This barge has two additional barges attached to it using hinges. This barge provides a pivot point or fulcrum for two levers. The following animation shows the fast and fascinating process that a casing stone was pushed tightly up against the stone it is next to and set in place in the exact position that it needed to be. Water enters the positioning barge and that barge lowers until it is resting on the bottom of the pond. Then water is allowed to enter one of the auxiliary barges which pivots on the hinge. The powerful force of this barge pivoting causes one of the levers to move exerting tremendous force on the casing stone which positions the casing stone in one direction. Water is allowed to enter the other auxiliary barge which ultimately moves the casing stone in the other direction. This process causes the casing stone to be positioned into its final resting place. The casing stone is pushed so tight up against the casing stone next to it that the bonding agent oozes out. The excess bonding agent that oozed out from the joint was quickly removed and reused when the next casing stone was set in place. The bonding agent which squeezed out of the joint is reused when the next casing stone is set in place. At this point in the process, water is siphoned from the specialized positioning barge, which is then moved out of the way. By this time, another casing stone has already been attached to a barge using shims and ropes. The next casing stone and barge are moved into position, and the process will repeat itself. The positioning barge has done its task. Water is siphoned out of all the barges and the positioning barge is moved out of the way. Then another casing stone is moved into position ready to be set in its final resting place. The following animation shows a very simplified depiction of what somebody standing on the Giza Plateau would see as they watch the construction process. This is the systematic method that the casing stones were set in place. When the Great Pyramid was built, the casing stones were set in place almost as fast as the depiction you are watching. This process is certainly faster than any method proposed by the science of Egyptology. That science is yet to lift a 16-ton payload one inch.
the systematic process continues with production line efficiencies. Removing the ropes and shims and applying the bonding agent is not depicted for uh, simplicity. This type of rapid and powerful stone moving techniques cannot be accomplished using back muscles. The construction process required many barges to move up the water locks. These barges were quickly emptied as depicted in the previous videos. How are these empty barges moved from the pond and ultimately back to the quarries so that these barges can be used again to bring additional stones? Please watch the following video because I think you'll be surprised by the answer. While the Great Pyramid was under construction, there was a relentless flow of materials to the building site. A parade of stones on barges moved up the water locks from the Nile River up to the Great Pyramid construction site. The stones on barges traveled up the water locks and into the pond impounded by the casing stones. In previous videos, it was depicted how both casing stones and rough cut interior stones were quickly removed from the barges and set in their final resting places. These empty barges needed to be returned to the quarries so that they could be used again to bring another load of stones to continue the construction of the Great Pyramid. These empty barges cannot go down the series of water locks built into the wall of casing stones. This is because it would interrupt the flow of materials up the water locks. To build and use an additional series of water locks to move empty barges back down would double the complexity of the stone transportation method and it would be unnecessary. There is an additional option available to the original builders which is fast, simple, and efficient. This option is to move the empty barges over the side of the pond impounded by the casing stones and lower the empty barges down the side of the Great Pyramid into the canal that surrounds the Great Pyramid. Stones on barges move up the water locks, but empty barges move over the side of the pond. An empty barge is moved on the rollers. Water is siphoned from the pond and added to the container, which causes the device to pivot. The empty barge has been moved up onto this dedicated machine and is now ready to be moved over the side of the pond. A rope is attached to the empty barge. The empty barge is moved over the side and workers using the rope control its downward descent to the canal that surrounds the Great Pyramid. Although not shown, water is allowed to drain from the container which causes the dedicated machine to move back to its original position and it is ready to receive another empty barge. Instead of using a dedicated machine to move empty barges over the side of the pond, the floating barge crane could also be used for this purpose. How fascinating it is that on the Giza Plateau there are several excavations of various sizes that are known as boat pits. Possibly one of these boat pits held a barge used as a floating crane for this very purpose. The barge crane easily and quickly moves the empty barge over the side of the pond.
a rope is attached to the empty barge and this rope is held taut by workers in the pond. Workers using the rope can control the downward movement of the empty barge. After the empty barge was moved over the side of the pond, the empty barge would be lowered down the side of the Great Pyramid until it reached the canal which encompassed the Great Pyramid. Wrapping the rope around the round stone gives the workers in the pond the ability to lower the empty barge down the side of the Great Pyramid at the proper rate of travel. Once the empty barge is in the canal which surrounds the Great Pyramid, it joins the parade of empty barges which make their journey back to the quarries so that they can bring additional stones back up to the building site. This progression of stones on barges moving up the water locks and empty barges moving over the side is a process that continued 24 hours a day. The procession of empty barges make their journey back to the quarries. The empty barges are headed towards the causeway. Research indicates that the causeway was used to move the empty barges down back to the Nile River. This was done using rollers under the empty barges and ropes to control the rate of speed that the empty barges travel down the causeway. When a level of the Great Pyramid was near completion, the devices used to move barges over the side were simply lifted up and set on top of the next higher level of casing stones. The original builders were geniuses in their use of specialized barges, water locks, the buoyancy of water, an extremely strong bonding agent, and a host of other techniques. The combination of all these factors was what made the construction of the Great Pyramid possible. The dedicated machine is also easily moved in the very same manner. In preparing to lift the dedicated machine to the next higher level, the rollers were moved out of the way. Next, the boat crane was moved into position The boat crane quickly lifts the dedicated machine up and sets it on top of the next higher level of casing stones. No strong back muscles are required. Workers put the rollers back in place and the dedicated machine is ready to operate again. The versatile, adaptable, powerful, controllable, and fast techniques for moving massive amounts of payloads depicted in these videos is how the Great Pyramid was built. The following video provides information about the workers and how they were brought up to the pond where the bulk of the construction process occurred as well as how workers were moved back down after the end of the work shift. Subsequent videos will show how the largest stones were moved and set in place, 
as well as how the capstone, if there ever was one, was placed on top of the Great Pyramid. Much of the research on how the Great Pyramid was built focuses on the movement and placement of stones, yet it is the workers that do these activities. It is just as interesting to focus on the actions and activities of the workers as it is to concentrate on the movement of stones. As depicted in the simple animations in this series of videos, workers operate water locks, use siphon hoses with valves on each end, move the specialized barges, operate boat cranes, apply a strong bonding agent, and other similar activities, many of which were performed 24 hours a day. These employees worked in shifts and needed to be at their work area at the beginning of the shift. Just like all workers, at the end of the shift they needed to leave the work area and the job site. Workers would hitch a ride on barges as they traveled up the water locks which were built into the wall of casing stones. The duration of their commute up to the pond impounded by the casing stones would have been much shorter and quicker than the commute of most modern workers in our age. Employees heading up the water locks to start their work shift. What an interesting ride to work that would be. Moving workers back down at the end of the shift would have been one highlight of the day as well as an interesting activity. Just like everything else, the workers would finish their shift, then go over the side of the pond and move down into the canal surrounding the Great Pyramid. Of course, this would be done using specialized techniques and barges built specific for this purpose. This specialized barge was used to lower workers down the side of the Great Pyramid. After the specialized barge was moved over the side of the pond by the boat crane, workers would position the stairs incorporated into this barge. Then a rope would be attached to the specialized barge. This rope would be used to lower the barge in the same way empty barges were lowered down the side of the Great Pyramid. The ladder was moved into position. A rope was secured to the ladder. Workers in the pond hold the barge in place with the rope. At this point in time, the boat crane would disconnect its rope and the boat crane would be moved out of the way. This barge over the side of the pond is now held in place by the rope which goes around the round stone and is held by workers in the pond. It is now time for other workers whose shift is over to enter this barge by walking down the ladder. The boat crane is no longer needed and it is moved out of the way. The purpose of this video is not to say that this is exactly the size and shape of barge that was used to move the workers down. The purpose of this video and other videos in this series is much more important. It is to show methods that would have been immediately apparent to the original builders who were using barges, water locks, and the buoyancy of water to build their wonder of the world. The ideas touched upon in these videos are addressed much more fully and fleshed out in the two books I have written about the Great Pyramid. These books are Lost Technologies of the Great Pyramid 
which is about how the Great Pyramid was built. And also my second book, which is titled The Great Pyramid Prosperity Machine, which is about why the Great Pyramid was built. Both of these books are in bookstores, and if they don't have it, the bookstore can order it for you. Or they are both available as Kindle ebooks. Workers enter the barge by walking down the ladder. The work shift is over and these workers are heading home for a nice cold glass of beer. Now that the workers have entered this specialized barge, it is time that it is lowered down the side of the Great Pyramid. This is accomplished by other workers who are holding the rope which goes around the round stone. These workers allow the barge to move down the side at a controlled rate. What a fun trip that would be to ride that barge all the way down the side of the Great Pyramid. The ladder is returned to the upright position and the rope is removed from the barge. The barge loaded with workers is lowered to the canal which surrounds the Great Pyramid in a rapid and controlled manner. The barge is moved across the canal and from there workers leave the barge and go have a beer. The specialized barge will be used to move supplies, bonding agent, tools, food, and other workers as the barge travels back up the series of water locks until it gets back to the pond impounded by the casing stones. The barge is moved across the canal. These workers have finished their shift and they're done until their next day of work. Oh, what an honor it would be to be among the workers who were able to accomplish what is impossible for Egyptologists. What an honor it would be to share some beers with these proud and accomplished workers as they discuss the events of their time at work. Just imagine how much more valuable that would be in understanding how the Great Pyramid was built than to sit in a classroom being lectured by an Egyptologist. The largest stones of the Great Pyramid are massive. Some estimates place the weight of these largest stones upwards to 70 tons. This includes the ceiling stones of the King's Chamber and the Queen's Chamber. The weight of these massive behemoths is comparable to that of a railroad locomotive. The movement of these massive stones is often considered one of the most difficult tasks the original builders faced when they built the Great Pyramid. Egyptologists tell us many of the most massive stones originated from quarries far from the building site. The most researchers, historians, and Egyptologists agree that these massive stones were moved downstream along the Nile River close to the building site by using barges.
but Egyptologists are unable to provide an explanation accompanied with demonstrations of how these largest stones on barges were moved from the Nile River up to the building site. The science of Egyptology has yet to move any 70-ton payload one inch. The way in which the original builders actually accomplished this goal is far more interesting than the unsubstantiated stories provided by Egyptology. At first glance, one would think these massive stones on barges would travel up the series of water locks from the Nile River up to the building site. But this is not the case. These water locks are designed specifically to transport barges which can carry a much smaller payload. The series of water locks are designed to handle 99% of all the stones used to build the Great Pyramid. There are only a few dozen gargantuan stones which weigh in the range of 70 tons. It would not be prudent to build a series of water locks large enough to transport just a few dozen gargantuan stones. Also, it is technically impossible to build a series of extremely large water locks up the side of the Great Pyramid, yet these largest stones must be moved to the building site. Research indicates the original builders created a series of temporary stepped ponds which followed the contour of the slope of the terrain between the Nile River and the building site. These stepped ponds could have accommodated a single massive stone on barge or many stones on barges. The simple animation provided in this video shows five stones at a time being moved through these temporary stepped ponds. Water was supplied to these ponds from the building site. These ponds only needed to be about four feet deep. Therefore, little excavation was required and the ponds were impounded by temporary berms. Instead of using precision masonry and finely built water lock doors, the stepped ponds were separated by simply creating a wall by backfilling material between two stepped ponds. Let's travel down from the building site along these temporary stepped ponds and watch the fascinating process of moving the most massive stones of the Great Pyramid up to the building site. The process is ready to begin. The temporary ponds are ready. The source water for these ponds was made available by the original builders who supplied water to the construction site. Five massive stones are down at the level of the Nile River, all waiting to begin their journey up to the building site. At this stage of the process, a berm is backfilled between the lowest temporary pond and the Nile River. Water is allowed to fill the lowest temporary pond which raises the level of the pond as well as the stones on barges. Enough water is provided to partially fill the next higher stepped pond. A temporary wall separating these two stepped ponds is backfilled into position and then the pond with the stones on barges is raised higher by adding additional water from the building site. This additional water also provides adequate water for the next higher stepped pond, allowing for the barges carrying stones to continue their journey. The process continues and another temporary berm is backfilled to separate two stepped ponds. Water from the construction site is used to fill the pond that the stones on barges are floating in. The massive stones on barges can now move to the next pond as they progress upwards towards the building site. This systematic process continues. Another berm is backfilled between two ponds and then water is added to the higher pond, raising the stones on barges. In this animation, five 70-ton stones are being moved. This is equivalent to 350 tons.
These stones on barges are progressing up towards the building site. The temporary stepped ponds act like water locks as the stones rise higher and higher in elevation. Although not shown, an additional group of stones on barges would already be moving up this series of stepped ponds. These massive stones were already on barges as they traveled from the quarries along the Nile River. These stones continue their journey to the building site, still using barges and the buoyancy of water. This trip through the stepped ponds probably took no longer than a few days to complete. This method is lightning fast compared to the dismal failure Egyptology has provided in showing how these most massive stones were moved. The Great Pyramid was built as planned. The massive stones on barges were brought to the building site during the initial stages of construction. The 70-ton stones on barges were brought directly into the pond and pounded by the casing stones. These massive stones on barges floated on the pond and pounded by the casing stones. They floated on the pond as the surface of the pond impounded by the casing stones rose higher and higher as the construction process continued. Those massive stones rested on their barges until the construction process reached the level that the stones would be used. These stones are now entering the last temporary stepped pond. This pond will allow the stones on barges to be lifted up to the level of the pond impounded by the casing stones. When this process occurs, the stones on barges can float into the pond impounded by the casing stones. The last stepped pond and the pond impounded by the casing stones are now at the same level. The massive 70 ton stones on barges are easily floated into the pond impounded by the casing stones. After all of the few dozen massive stones on barges which were needed to build the Great Pyramid entered the pond impounded by the second layer of casing stones, the level of this pond is lower down to the first level of casing stones. Then the second layer of casing stones can be completed. This is accomplished by removing the berms which made up the temporary stepped ponds and then setting in place the last few casing stones of the second level. The original builders were truly geniuses. These massive stones on barges floated on the pond impounded by the casing stones. The level of the surface of that pond rose as the construction process continued. But how was a massive stone, the weight of a locomotive, moved off of these barges and set in its final location where it will stay forever? The answer to that question is the subject of the next video. Moving the largest stones up to the necessary height and setting them in place is seemingly one of the most difficult technological feats necessary in the construction of the Great Pyramid. Yet the original builders were without question able to accomplish this task. In the previous video we saw how these massive stones on barges moved from the Nile River up to the building site during the very earliest stages of construction. These massive payloads weighing up to 70 tons accompanied by the barges supporting them were too large to fit the water locks designed to move much smaller payloads. This is true for the water locks which were built into the casing stones. These most massive stones on barges rose as the pond impounded by the casing stones rose as construction progressed. When it was time to set these massive stones in place, they were already available floating on barges in this pond. Yet the original builders needed to move these huge payloads from the barges to their final resting place. The focus of this video is to depict how that was accomplished.
The largest stones on barges were not intended to move up the water locks built into the casing stones. There was much activity occurring on this pond, but our focus in this video is to see how a ceiling stone of the king's chamber was moved from the barges to its final resting place. As construction progressed, the largest stones on barges rose as the pond impounded by the casing stone rose. The task before us is to move a ceiling stone for the king's chamber from the barges and set this massive payload in place on top of the walls of the king's chamber. We can look into the king's chamber and see the coffer already installed inside it. Also, the pond is only waist deep. Additional barges are used to support both ends of the stone. Water is removed from these two barges, causing them to raise up and support the ends of the king's chamber ceiling stone. Spacers are installed between the barges and the ceiling stone. The purpose of these spacers will become apparent in just a few minutes. With the additional support of barges on each end of the stone, these spacers can be installed one at a time without any problems. With the additional buoyancy provided by barges on each end of the stone, Two barges are now lowered by allowing water to enter them, and those two barges are moved out of the way. Now it is time to add additional water to the pond. This will cause the surface of the pond to rise, which will lift the ceiling stone on barges. Now the barges can move over the king's chamber wall. This will allow the ceiling stone to move closer to its final destination. Additional water added to the pond causes it to rise. This pond is impounded by the casing stones that have already been installed. Raising the level of the pond allows the barges to move the ceiling stone closer to its final destination. The spacers placed between the barges and the ceiling stone allow the barges to move under the ceiling stones that have already been set in place. Water is now allowed to enter the barges. This causes the ceiling stone to be gently lowered onto the top of the king's chamber walls. Yet the king's chamber ceiling stone is not quite yet at its final destination. There is still more to this fascinating process. The ceiling stone is easily moved right next to a ceiling stone that is already installed. Every aspect of this process is systematic and well-organized. 
the barges floating in the king's chamber must be removed. This is accomplished quickly and easily by using a floating crane. The barges floating in the king's chamber are easily and quickly removed. When all the barges in the king's chamber are moved out of the way, the next step in the process can begin. Two positioning barges are quickly moved in place. These barges are the same that were used to position the casing stones. They will be used to move the ceiling stone to its exact final resting place. Water is allowed to enter these barges so that they rest on the bottom of the waist deep pond. Then water is allowed to enter the auxiliary barges. This causes the ceiling stone to be pushed up against the ceiling stone it is beside. Water is removed from the positioning barges and these barges are quickly moved out of the way. Now it is time to repeat the process and install the next ceiling stone of the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid. Moving a ceiling stone from the barges that support it and then placing that ceiling stone at its final location was actually rather easy. It had to be because it is beyond the scope of human muscles to move these payloads to achieve these results. Simply by adapting readily apparent moving techniques and using water and barges, moving the largest stones is a rather simple and actually quite fast task that was performed by the ancient geniuses. My hope is that someday people in the here and now will eventually catch up to the ancient geniuses who were able to move and set in place these most massive stones to complete their building, which in our day is a wonder of the world. The next video will address why the Great Pyramid was built in the pyramid shape, and then this video series will conclude with the information relating to how the Great Pyramid was finished as well as how the capstone of the Great Pyramid was set in place. I'd like to thank everyone who has watched this video series. We appreciate your open mind and your consideration of the ideas presented in these videos. I know that the interest in this direction of research has been very high. On a personal note, it has been a very interesting experience to pursue extensive research concerning this method for the construction of the Great Pyramid. But why was the Great Pyramid built in a pyramid shape? Some have suggested the purpose was symbolic to represent the primordial mound, or the pyramid shape is a symbolic representation of the rays of the sun from the sun god or other such symbolic representations. But I would like to present an entirely different alternative. This alternative is more about the synthesis of form and function as it relates to the construction method proposed in my books and the video series. The following animations will help illustrate this alternative explanation of why the Great Pyramid was built in the pyramid shape. 
This simple animation shows a river valley. To impound the water, our civilization typically uses a dam which causes a lake to form behind the dam. Instead of a river valley, imagine a hilly area that one would want to create a pond. To do this, in effect, dams would be created between the hills and these dams would impound water to create a pond. Now imagine that there were no hills and four dams are built all back to back and these four dams impound a pond. That is in effect what the original builders were doing as described in this video series when they were building the Great Pyramid. In a sense, these four dams rose higher and higher as the construction process continued. The following animation shows a simple cutaway view of the Great Pyramid as it neared completion. The animation shows the mound of rock the Great Pyramid was built over and it also shows that the pond was always about waist deep. This animation also depicts the majority of the Great Pyramid consists of the rough cut interior stones. Large gravity dams are one of the best opportunities to get a sense of what the Great Pyramid looked like when it was still covered by the beautiful precision cut casing stones. The Dorshack Dam in Idaho and most notably the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington State are both wonderful examples of gravity dams. I've been to both of these dams and to stand up close at the base of the face of these dams and look up you get a tremendous sense of what the Great Pyramid once looked like. How fascinating it is that these dams as well as the Great Pyramid have a very fundamental relationship with water. The faces of these dams give an impression of what the faces of the Great Pyramid originally looked like. Although the Great Pyramid and hydroelectric dams operate in completely different manners, they are massive structures that were created to be infrastructure for the civilizations which built them. Hydroelectric dams as well as the Great Pyramid were operational machines that created prosperity for the civilizations that had the vision and the ability to construct them. The construction method used to build the Great Pyramid was an important factor in determining the shape of this structure. The walls of casing stones were cemented together with an extremely strong bonding agent which impounded a pond that was used during construction to assemble the Great Pyramid. But as the assembly process continued the size of the pond decreased. Ultimately, this pond will be too small to accommodate the large floating cranes. So how did the original builders finish the construction of the Great Pyramid and set the capstone in place? That is the subject of the next video in this series. In our modern age, no one really knows for certain if the Great Pyramid originally had a capstone or not. There is no direct physical evidence which indicates if the Great Pyramid did or did not have a capstone. Many modern day researchers and authors are certain that the Great Pyramid did have a capstone. They are equally certain as to what this capstone was made of. Some say stone, others are certain it was gold or even electrum. Others contend the capstone was actually a large jewel or crystal. The proposed purposes of the capstone are as varied as the proposed material it was made of. Some say it had symbolic or religious significance, or that it was an important part of an alien beacon or weapon. Others contend with equal certainty that the Great Pyramid did not have a capstone. Generally, for religious reasons, they contend there was no capstone and the Great Pyramid was unfinished based on Bible verses. I don't know if the Great Pyramid did or did not have a capstone, but if it did, it is simply just another stone of this building.
This video is about how the capstone was set in place, if there ever was one. The capstone, or sometimes called pyramidion, would have been the same shape as the Great Pyramid itself. It probably weighed several tons. It may have had a protrusion on its bottom side that fit into a socket. Just like the other stones, the capstone would have traveled up the series of water locks built into the casing stones. But before we set the capstone in place, the upper levels of the Great Pyramid must be assembled. The issue that is readily apparent in assembling the upper levels of the Great Pyramid is that the pond becomes smaller and smaller and ultimately too small for the large boat crane used to move the rough cut interior stones off the barges and down into the pond. There are smaller boat pits around the Great Pyramid on the Giza Plateau. This indicates there may have been smaller boat cranes used during the final stages of construction. Ultimately, in the final stages of construction, the pond would be too small to accommodate boat cranes. Based on research conducted by the Pharaoh's Pump Foundation, this author contends the original builders modified the construction method to allow the completion of the uppermost levels. The original builders created a temporary artificial wall to impound the pond instead of using the casing stones. This artificial wall was anchored into and supported by the casing stones. A notch built into the casing stones would anchor the bottom of a temporary wall to impound a pond. A large temporary enclosure would be built high up on the Great Pyramid. It would be securely supported by the notch built into the casing stones. There was a door in one wall which allowed the pond to receive stones on barges from the uppermost water lock. The top of the temporary wooden enclosure is made secure and strong enough to withstand the pressure of the water when this enclosure is filled. As construction continues, each level becomes progressively smaller and smaller. This requires another modification of the construction procedure. The interior stones are now set in place first for each level before the casing stones of that level. This is made possible because the temporary wooden enclosure is now impounding the pond instead of the casing stones. We'll move the upper supports out of the way. The construction process continues, but this temporary wooden enclosure impounds the pond instead of the casing stones. The watertight door is shut, sealing the wooden enclosure from the uppermost water lock. Water enters the enclosure and the construction process continues. The placement of stones is still level by level, but the area near the uppermost water lock is left unfinished. This allows clearance for the stones on barges to enter from the water lock into the enclosure. Remember, it is now the temporary enclosure that impounds the water, not the casing stones. We'll remove one of the walls of the temporary enclosure and watch the process of moving stones up to the level being assembled. The stone-laden barge enters the temporary enclosure from the water lock. 
the watertight door is shut and water is added to this enclosure, lifting the barge up to the necessary height. The interior stones are set in place and then the casing stones are set in place level by level. The original builders were truly geniuses. Stones on barges move from the uppermost water lock and enter the enclosure. The watertight door is closed and water is added to the enclosure and the barge rises up through the unfinished area and up to the necessary height. The order of stone placement in these uppermost levels continues to be the interior stones for a level first and then the casing stones for that level. It is almost time to set the capstone in place. In preparing for the placement of the capstone, the last few stones are set in place. These stones are the stones that the capstone will rest on. A socket is made ready to receive the protrusion on the underside of the capstone. All is ready to set the capstone in place. The challenge is to move this pyramidion up over 450 feet higher than the Giza Plateau, then move the multiple ton stone from the barge and finally setting this stone down so that the protrusion slides into the socket without damaging the capstone. How that is accomplished, as well as finishing the Great Pyramid, is the subject of the following video. Placing the capstone, if there ever was one, on the Great Pyramid would have been a crowning achievement for those ancient geniuses who created their wonder of the world. Although many are fascinated by the capstone for religious or esoteric reasons, this video will depict placing the uppermost stone on top of the Great Pyramid. Our contention is that the capstone was not the last stone set in place. There was other work necessary to finish the Great Pyramid after the capstone was installed. This is consistent with Herodotus when he wrote about the Great Pyramid being built from the bottom up but was finished from the top down. The capstone on barge started its journey to the Great Pyramid from the Nile River up the water locks. These water locks from the Nile River to the building site allow the capstone on barge to travel quickly and easily to the building site. Like the vast majority of stones, the capstone makes its journey up the series of water locks as it travels towards the top of the Great Pyramid. The capstone finishes its journey up this series of water locks by entering the uppermost water lock. The barge with capstone can now move into the wooden temporary enclosure and then the watertight door is shut. 
We'll remove one side of the temporary enclosure to better see what is going on inside. The water level in this enclosure is raised up to the necessary height and additional barges are brought into position. The barge carrying the capstone was built to accommodate the wooden supports which are installed at this time. The capstone is now resting on the two beams which are supported by the two barges. Those barges floating on the water in the temporary enclosure are moved so that the capstone is directly over its final location. Water is now allowed to enter these two barges which gently lowers the capstone down to its final resting place on top of the Great Pyramid. Now that the capstone is in place, the remainder of the stones just under the capstone are set in place. These stones are relatively small and were probably cemented in place using the strong bonding agent the original builders used to bond together other stones. This finishing stonework was done by hand. With the capstone set in place, water and barges are removed from the temporary enclosure. The temporary enclosure is disassembled and the pieces were brought down the water locks, which were still functional. Yet there is still that unfinished area that must be filled in and finished. The unfinished area is filled in by hand. The materials needed to accomplish this are brought up through the water locks. This process of filling in by hand continued as the water locks up the face of the Great Pyramid were removed and then filled in. This was accomplished by filling in the uppermost water lock and then filling in the water lock below it. The water locks were still operational and materials to accomplish this task were brought up the remaining water locks. The following animation shows how the water locks were built into the casing stones on the top of the casing stones below it. How fascinating it is that Herodotus wrote the Great Pyramid was built from the bottom up but finished from the top down. The water locks were built directly into the casing stones. This is best illustrated when the water locks are removed. The materials needed to fill in where the water locks were removed is brought up the remaining water locks. When these water locks are systematically removed and the filling in process is completed, the assembly process of the Great Pyramid is finished. Thank you for watching this video series about how the Great Pyramid was built. A tremendous amount of material was covered and many of the details of the construction process were not fully explored. A few short videos will not answer everything about the Great Pyramid. That is why I have written two books which follow this direction of research. These books are Lost Technologies of the Great Pyramid, which is about how the Great Pyramid was built. My other book is titled The Great Pyramid Prosperity Machine and it is about why the Great Pyramid was built. These books go into much more detail and answer many questions you may have that relate to this research. The Great Pyramid is finished in all its majesty. It is truly a wonder of the world.
When completed by the original builders, it was still covered by the beautiful casing stones. It was as Herodotus described it, like an island surrounded by water. Although not shown in the following animation, Herodotus also wrote that the Great Pyramid had an artificial duct connected to it. The following animation shows the Great Pyramid completed as planned by the original builders. This animation shows the groove that the bottom of the wooden temporary enclosure was held in. That groove may have been removed at the time the Great Pyramid was newly built. What an engineering marvel the Great Pyramid is. The Great Pyramid was built using a fascinating, efficient, fast, and powerful construction method. This was how the Great Pyramid was built. But what is more important to our modern civilization and our very troubled world is why the Great Pyramid was built. Our next video series is about why the Great Pyramid was built. This video series will provide a reason which justified the construction of the Great Pyramid. That video series will address a number of things we were unable to explore in this video series. Our next video series will detail how the original builders were able to provide a water supply at the Giza Plateau. Also, the following series describes how those ancient geniuses were able to provide water for the pond and to supply water for the water locks. Our next video series describes how water was delivered over 450 feet higher than the base of the Great Pyramid. I hope you enjoyed this video series and will watch our following series about why the Great Pyramid was built. If you have any questions, please contact the Pharaoh's Pump Foundation through our website at www.thepump.org. Thank you very much.